This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave for another tech nibble. Today we're looking at a Pong console. Now don't run away just because I've said that, I know there were hundreds of the things in the 1970s and Pong isn't the most exciting of games. It certainly has its place in history, but when you compare it to the Atari 2600, the Fairchild Channel F, it's just nowhere near as exciting. But this one is slightly different to all the others. For a start, it's by Commodore, a company we wouldn't normally associate with Pong, and there's something a bit different inside which I want to show you today. So we're going to have a very quick look at Tech Nibble at the Commodore TV game 3000H. Let's take a look. When you think of Commodore, you think of the PET, the C64, Amiga and their other microcomputers. What you don't often think of is Pong, but that's exactly what we've got here in the Commodore TV game model 3000H from 1977, the same year the Commodore PET appeared in stores. This model is complemented by a sister 2000K model. What attracted me to this, aside from the choice of brown cables and a few decades of dust and dirt, was of course the Commodore name, but also the year of production. In 1976, Commodore Business Machines bought Metal Oxide Semiconductor Technology, or MOS, for around 12 million US dollars, and it essentially became Commodore's production arm. From here came such chips as the SID and the 6502 found in the PET, Apple II, BBC Micro, Nintendo NES, and many other devices. What does this have to do with our Pong machine? Well, we'll open it up shortly and find out what makes it tick. Externally, there's not a great deal to set it apart from other Pong machines of the time. We've got sliders and switches to select game types and difficulties, and four paddles are supported for up to four players, with Player 1's paddle built right into the console, which I love. Imagine having a joystick built into the top of your Commodore 64. If that breaks, then you're in trouble. The Pong console craze was born out of the success of Atari's arcade cabinet of the same name, and helped largely by Atari's failure to patent the technology in a timely manner. Atari's own home Pong hit stores in 1975 through US retailer Sears, but by the time of Commodore's release in 1977, the gaming landscape had shifted significantly. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System, later renamed the Channel F, the British version of which I have right here, was the first programmable home games console, and it used cartridges offering a far greater variety of games than simple Pong machines. A game ROM coupled with a CPU meant that the style of game was no longer limited to a bat and ball derivative, and game designers could be far more imaginative in their creations. Very soon after the Fairchild came the Atari 2600 in all its wood grain glory, and the programmable home console industry was born. These machines were far more sophisticated than the hundreds of Pong consoles now on the market by 1977, most of which relied on discrete logic in the same way as the original arcade Pong cabinet did, or through Pong on a chip, using that same logic consolidated down into an integrated circuit. Our Commodore TV game though, that sat somewhere between the two approaches. Let's open it up and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Once it's carefully opened up, you can see inside here that there's actually very little going on. There's a familiar RF modulator in a shielded box here, and all of our components are on this side of the PCB, with traces on the underside. But one chip stands out at the center of the board with the heatsink sat atop it. Rather kindly, it's socketed, and sockets cost money, so that's an interesting addition by Commodore, but the option to swap this out is an important one, as we'll discover. If we take the chip out, and then prise the heatsink off of it, we can see that it's labeled. 
and that label is MPS 7601. This is the heart of the Commodore TV game. We have the 7601 as I'm in the PAL TV signal region. If you're in the NTSC region, you'd have the 7600. So I just refer to this as the 7600 or 7600 series from here on in. So what's the significance of this chip? As mentioned earlier, Pong took several approaches. There was the original discrete circuitry, an analog approach in which game values and parameters were stored as variable voltages in capacitors. There was Pong on a chip. The same approach was consolidated into a single integrated circuit, the most prevalent of which was the General Instruments AY38500 designed by Ralph H. Beer. This was first used by Coleco in their Telstar system in 1976. General Instruments were a rival of Commodore's, competition largely born out of sharing the electronic calculator market space. Of course, there was Pong as a game cartridge. With the Atari 2600, you could buy Pong in a more familiar format stored in a ROM on a game cartridge, and that would of course become the norm. And then there was this, Commodore's approach. What we have from Commodore is a programmable Pong console. The 7600 chip is a microprocessor that will operate according to the instructions you've programmed rather than following a rigid hard-coded or hardwired procedure. Information on the core of the 7600 is very limited. Some speculate it contains a 6502 core, others that it's a primitive calculator CPU repurposed for games. Look around though and there's a distinct lack of supporting chips. Where's the ROM for example? Well that too is within the 7600, as too is the circuitry to generate the graphics and sound. This was capable of four colours and sound which was emitted from the speaker, built into the case rather than the TV. This no doubt kept the cost down but it reduced flexibility quite significantly. With the game code in ROM within the 7600, the capacity of which was 512 words or 1.024 kilobytes, once your games were baked into the chip, that's what you were stuck with. It's an interesting middle ground between the new generation of programmable consoles and discrete logic or Pong on a chip based devices. And this approach didn't stop with Commodore's Pong consoles. The Coleco Telstar Arcade console in 1977 tried to set itself apart by having interchangeable cartridges and using the same 7600 chip. They got around the restrictions of the game being baked into the chip by including the entire 7600 chip in every single cartridge you purchased. Not the most efficient, but it did give the desired effect. Before long then, Pong and the many games it inspired would become just a cartridge, a disc, a tape, or even a listing in a book of coding. Computers and consoles would become CPU based, loading programs from external sources or removable media, just as we know them to be today. It's so easy to dismiss Pong just because of the sheer number of versions that are out there, but perhaps this proves that even in the technology that you consider to be a little bit more mundane, a little bit less exciting than others that are out there, there are still fun stories to be told and interesting facts to be found inside them. As always, thank you for watching and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.